decision to do the group thing. Mr. Co-Chair, for our audience, uh, the various presentation uh, materials uh, for today are on the back table. So for those in the audience, if you're wondering what somebody might be speaking about, there are some handouts, uh, and hopefully enough of them for everyone here uh, that you can get a copy of those materials. Thank you. Uh, Christian, thank you for your prayer. I mean, that's a start, a start, certainly. I mean, that's about that. What, what would you add to um, you know, I wasn't quite sure of the form here, but uh, I think one thing that uh, the theme has been, and I know Bob, we talked about it a little bit, and I don't know if I'm technically making a, uh, a presentation right now, I wasn't quite sure how the discussion was going to go. But I point to this, you know, how to spot the terrorists, and this is something I'll speak from a federal level real quickly. Um, one of the things that uh, Mrs. <coughs> believes, you know, we've been doing it this way for 36 years, nothing bad has happened, if it's not broke, let's not fix it. I think it's kind of the, the sentiment. Independent of the auditing and all that kind of stuff, I think that's a separate discussion about from the, any any database that we use and how do we monitor those. But I think what uh, Minnesota is missing or potentially missing, whether it's something they want to get out in front of, and the FBI's had to change too. We've been reactive to crime. We wait for something to happen, then we respond. Bank robbery happens, we respond. So our responding, there is a case, there is an investigation. We don't think about what's private, what's public, okay? But in a different day, post 9/11, of course. We're now being tasked to go out and prevent crime. I mean, that's kind of hard to do. Prevent crime, but how do you do that? Okay, we're supposed to spot through indicators and other things unusual behavior of people who might, you know, be inclined to, you know, be uh, blow us up more or less. All right. So, do we do this uh, profiling on bank robbers? Do we do this profiling on, on, uh, you know. Uh, routine criminal investigations. No, we do it on the, 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 uh, for the purpose of national security. So, and I'll use a real example here. And again, in a perfect world and everything worked, something that's kind of near and dear to this state in particular. Let's assume, okay, we actually had the ability to do intelligence gathering and we had the ability and the partnerships with our local police departments, all right? And there was a Phoenix memo in August of 2001 that said there are people out there who are flying planes and don't want to learn how to land. Okay? Now, I won't bore you with the details. It was looked over by the 9-11 report. This memo sat in someone's incoming box. It was the summer. Someone was on vacation. The reality is, okay, back then, even if somebody had looked at that and read it, we wouldn't know what to do with that information. Because the first thing we would say, well, who is it? What do we have on these people? We have nothing. We have no case. We are not bad guys. It's not a crime to learn how to fly and not want to land. So we might have just put it in the outgoing box as a, oh, what are you going to do with this? Okay, now we're supposed to think differently. Okay, so let's say in a perfect world, and, and we're not there yet, okay? I don't know if we'll ever get there, quite frankly. But the president and our director would like us to have the ability to say, wow, we get on this Phoenix memo, let's send out a blast communication to everybody to include our fusion centers, to include our local departments. Who out there is doing this? Okay? And that would go through whatever technology means we have, and there would be a collection platform, and all the law enforcement out there would say, okay, guess what? We found Heidi Ferrick is taking lessons here. John Smith is taking lessons here. And Misawi is taking lessons in Minnesota. All right? Now, perfect world, we'd have opened up something, and the Bureau now has what we call assessments. Now, there's been some, some press releases on this. Uh, die I don't bore you with that, but the bottom line is we were doing a lot of collection as well without technically any authority, for lack of a better word. It was one of those things where in 1995 there was no Google. So we weren't doing a lot of collecting because there really was no means to go about doing that. Then from 1995 to 2010, you know, we've got analysts doing all sorts of database checks. And then finally someone stepped up and said, under what authority are we doing this? And the reality is we really didn't have a formalized authority. So about two years ago they started with this framework, and now what we can do is we can open up assessments, okay? The bar is lower to open up assessment. There are only certain techniques we can do in assessment. We can't do a search warrant. We can't do, you know, we can't, uh, we can't wiretap someone's house in assessment, but we have certain techniques we can do in assessment. And that gives us authority to do basic, uh, unobtrusive collection on a person who might be involved in some kind of uh, criminal activity or activity that would in fact uh, hurt national security. So I think to finish my point, that's an issue that 
that needs a little bit more discussion in that to the degree that Minnesota is not going to get that tasking. Because if Masali and company said, you know, I wonder if they know that we're actually trying to learn how to fly planes and not land. Let's just check with Binjack because that is the old points data collection. You know, at that point, knowing what I understand about the Privacy Act right now, Minjack would have to release, yes, we now know that you are learning how to fly planes and not land. And that's incorrect. Okay. Okay, that is not correct. Well, they would have to release, and all they'd have to release is the fact that a person is the subject of data in Minjack. Period. Nothing else. So someone can simply call us and say, am I a subject of Minjack? And that's all they would have to know. But they, they may have to follow whatever policies and procedures were developed by MinJack to assure that the person asking that question was actually the subject of the data. But there's no criminal investigation right now. There's no criminal investigation. There's no criminal investigation. We don't have any crime. We have intelligence that people are learning. We think that's very odd. We don't know. And we're concerned that, you know, now, of course, we know why they did that. Before 9-11, we wouldn't even know if that was odd. You're saying right now we have something odd about somebody who might be planning a crime. Right. And we don't have any information that they are planning a crime. We have no idea whether, but, but it's just suspicious. And that's that whole essay, you know, suspicious activity. How would that go out into Minnesota, and how would that information be? Or could the fact that we're even inquiring about this be protected? No, it's public. It's yeah. public. Right. Because it's not classified right. as... So my, point, under so my point would be that if the FBI, well, now I know this, of course, um, we might say, you know what? We can't send that out to Minnesota because they're Privacy Act data. Sure. So we can't gather this intelligence in Minnesota. Sure. And, and, but are you doing it now? No. No, we're not. We're not. We're very aware. Matter of fact, we have, I have to be honest, we're actually less educated on it. We get so nervous that we don't send anything in Ninja. Yeah, and we had that conversation. Which is not, the, you know, it's like, and I, I got there and there was a, 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 a piece of intelligence. I said, this would be perfect for the fusion center. This is exactly how I see this working. They said, oh no, Patty, you're new here. We can't send that out for this reason. So whether it's accurate or not, are we going to get in the weeds as, as to whether it's private? We're just going to simply say, you know what? You we may, don't understand the law. We may overreact. We're going to overreact and say, you know what? Just Minnesota, keep doing what you're doing. You don't need to be a part of the fusion center. You know. Here are a couple of things that I think are, are I think everyone agrees, and that is the world. You know, since 2001, you're saying the world is a scarier place. Pete Connor's experience over 36 years as a prosecutor describing how. He's dealing with scarier and scarier situations. It totally resonates with my experience starting in courtrooms in 1983 through the late 90s when I stopped going into the courtroom all the time. It got a lot scarier during that period of time, and the people got scarier. So I completely agree that the world is a scarier place, and it's one of the reasons we're here is to talk about how do we respond to that intelligently. How do we respond not out of fear? I don't want to go to Representative Mullery's committee or uh, Senator Limmer's committee and say, here are a bunch of recommendations that I'm making because I'm really afraid. Instead, <coughs> again, to, to quote Mr. Connors, I want real evidence. I, I mentioned that last time. Show me, show us the files. And I launched an idea that lasted for about a split second. Uh, let's have an executive session. And Don said, no, no, that'd be a violation of, uh, of open meeting. <laughs> so then I cast about, and there's another recommendation in your pile of stuff. And it is the trusted file reviewer. And this is, again, trying to get to a point where I'm not sitting in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee or a committee in the House, and they're saying, what is the real evidence that you based your decision and your recommendation on? And I have to say, and eh, I know, half of us are non-law enforcement, so we've never seen these files. Half are, and they've seen them, and they deal with them, and you talk about them. And Mike Goldstein and his department has various needs to gather information about people who may commit a crime. He sees those. You see those. Half of this work group has never seen them because they're not law enforcement. So in your materials, there's the trusted file reviewer. <coughs> um, and, uh, Jim's got a question. Go, go ahead, Bob. Okay. <coughs> and, uh, and my thought is uh, uh, the, Ramsey, the Ramsey County bench is sort of traditional.
traditionally serves state government needs. Um, we, we find a retired judge, we go to the chief judge and say, why do one of your judges to be a trusted file reviewer for this work group? Or talk to a retired judge who has a lot of time in their hands and say, uh, we have a bunch of files. You sign a release, or you sign a commitment to keep the information confidential. The work group is comfortable with this individual. That individual goes through whatever files are produced to, that support the argument that the government data practices actually be changed to allow confidential information about people who might commit crimes. I, uh, I, I raise the fact that the Data Practices Act has been in place for 36 years, not to further an argument that just because it's been around that long means we can't change it. But because it's been around for a long time, we'd better do our due diligence in fully gathering information about any recommendations that we make to the legislature. So when they say, what did you base your recommendation on? We can say, well, we had a trusted file reviewer who looked at a pile of files and said, you bet, I saw a lot of very good reasons to change the Data Practices Act. And there's another uh, area that began to concern me since the last meeting. Remember I talked about Iowa. Uh, well, hang on, hand out a little memo that uh, documents that my completely inadequate knowledge of the state-by-state -state status of these kinds of laws. I know Minnesota doesn't have a law allowing confidential data and in, 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 in intel purposes, and I know Iowa does. The other 48 states, I have a question mark. I don't know anything about Wisconsin. I don't know anything about the Dakotas. I don't know anything about any other state. So if I were a law professor, I would find it an enticing invitation to have a bunch of law students give us that information. So if Senator Wimmer has one of our chairs on the hot seat in the Senate Judiciary Committee and says, what are other states doing that our chairs don't have to say, uh -huh, we never ask. So I have three ideas that I'm kind of seeding the discussion. One is license plate reader. Two, to have the trusted file reviewer look at the files that can give us the hard evidence that we need to make a recommendation. And three, let's find out what the language is in other states. I mean, if, if, 50, if, if 49 states allow criminal intelligence data and we're the last one, then my thinking is very different. If only Iowa allows it and we're going to be the second state in the nation, I'm at the other end of the scale. So I kind of need a national context. There's an, a second advantage to doing that, and that is as we craft any language that we may be recommending to the legislature, we can learn what other states have done to get around some of these thorny kinds of issues. So I do have a handout on the state-by-state -state issue that I'd ask you to take a look at. You already have in your um, in your materials the the L 